Okay, then I suggest we start with our next session, with session three, after we already talked about future skills and how to promote them in universities and in the second <coughs> session about the new roles of traditional universities, but also new players. We now switch to the topic of national system uh, systems and globalization. Um, we have three speakers in the session, and we start with Costas Guliamos. Uh, he's the rector of the European University Cyprus and also member of the European Academy of Science and Arts and was former advisor of the European As University Association. So, Costas, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure and honor to participate in this uh, stimulating conference. Uh, Congratulations to Castellus and to Reinmar and all colleagues over there in, in Germany, in Munich. Uh, so the higher education uh, system across Europe, uh, as you know quite well, has changed some over the past 20 years. To my understanding, there is a shift, a major shift from the Hubbardian model of a university uh, from university culture to a Bologna education ecosystem. Development, privatization, the expansion of uh, curricula, joint programs, internationalization and globalization processes have radically transformed the national higher education systems. In my region, in southern eastern Europe, uh, Mediterranean, if you prefer, these uh, processes of change have been run parallel to all embracing political, economic and uh, social uh, transformations. Uh, in Cyprus, uh, particularly, accreditation is a process measured by the Cyprus Agency of Quality Assurance and Accreditation in Higher Education. The agency, as any uh, agency across Europe, is, uh, is aligned with procedures grounded in internationally acceptable quantitative and uh, qualitative uh, criteria, along with uh, indicators and guidelines affiliated with the European Area of Higher Education, uh, with the acronym and, uh, ESG. Uh, further to this, it is essential to note the fact that the uh, European Commission has published a proposal for uh, a council recommendation on promoting automatic recognition of higher education. It is worth to note that uh, the fact that the council adopted the recommendation in November uh, 2018, if I remember quite well. However, various, uh, various uh, European uh, Union's uh, uh, reports uh, indicate lack of awareness, uh, lack of awareness uh, among uh, staff responsible for recognition related procedures, uh, procedures and decisions. In this co context, it is necessary uh, to establish a common European approach to academic uh, recognition. Improving uh, procedures for the mutual recognition of qualifications in the European Union member states, uh, states is the cornerstone to establishing a European education area by 2025 and later on 2030. Uh, within this context, universities are situated uh, in a very, very competitive environment in which national uh, borders are routinely crossed. Uh, I, consider, I consider a university ecosystem uh, as a single universal arrangement, not as a unitary global system, but as a more complex combination of uh, of global flows and networks of ideas, knowledge and institutional dealings be with national higher education systems shaped by history, law and uh, policies and finally national uh, uh, universities, na national higher education players who are operating at the same time locally, internationally and uh, globally. Moreover, 
there are new forms of competition in uh, in higher education and we have to take seriously into co into consideration this development from a con competition uh, point of view from a competition uh, for students to competition for budgets and from competition to schools rankings to competition for hiring prominent professors and high quality research staff. The growing form of competition has saved new classifications and uh, categories and that to the emerging of grouping universities in the form of leagues, uh, networks like the Utrecht network, alliances uh, or associations. Finally, uh, uh, we have to see uh, the whole picture from a global point of view. In other words, Europe versus world regions. Universities ranking uh, affect domestic public policies, affect also, you know, the strategic uh, uh, visions and uh, policies of each individual university. U European competitive processes such as uh, the building of European higher education area provide opportunities to domestic uh, reformers. Uh, despite European heterogeneous higher education systems, universities' strategic goals incorporate the codes of attractiveness and internationalization in their academic operations. Regarding the international dimension of higher education reforms, there is a need. There is a need to consider the European university system within a broader international context. Nevertheless, in the face of the European Union universities, continuing commitment to internationalization, nowadays it turns more and more frequently to sign bilateral uh, um, MOUs with universities from, from China, from India, from North America and elsewhere around, uh, uh, around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Kostas. Um, so you talked about uh, the competition, um, not, not, not only between the universities, but also between new competitors and universities. How and between, can uh, between uh, big, uh, I would say, regions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how can this European higher education system react better and faster to this changing demands we see in the economy regarding the skills of their future employees? Uh, thank you for this excellent question. Uh, I would like to say by implementing the, the knowledge future. Uh, uh, you know that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, European uh, Commission, in collaboration with the European University Association, uh, brought up uh, a knowledge future intelligent policy choices for Europe 2050. Uh, I refer to the report by an expert group of foresight on key long-term transformations of European systems. In other words, research innovation and higher education. So in Europe, we need uh, to create the necessary conditions to capitalize on the results of research and innovation, to boost excellence in cutting edge uh, uh, programs uh, or even fundamental research, uh, to reinforce our international and community engagement uh, through science diplomacy and build stronger regional innovation ecosystems. I would like to say that, uh, to be more concrete, uh, and in my answer to your question is, at least three major trends are destabilizing the status quo in Europe's uh, knowledge system. First is the globalization one. As the world gets more interconnected and economic competition expands, the way we learn, discover, or innovate will change and the impact will hit uh, home faster and harder. Demographic change is another subject. The move to cities, the aging population, the shifts in family size and social norms all uh, will alter what we expect and uh, can do in education, research and innovation. And finally, there is the technological change uh, as, a, as an accelerator factor. 
just 35 years ago came uh, text uh, editors. Now, gene editing. By 2050, what next? Who knows? It's invasion coming faster and faster, changes not only our society and economy, but also our expectations and the way that we work in education, science and, uh, and uh, business. In other words, to finalize, uh, we have to strengthen European level cooperation, to encourage efforts to update educational curricula and certificate programs, to adapt them for an age of fast changing jobs. This is very, very crucial, I would say. This includes, of course, uh, reinvigorating the Bologna process to modernize educational standards across European Union uh, while ensuring increasingly flexible curricula, curricula that responds to society and business uh, needs. Thank you, Kostas. Okay, um, then we switch to our next speaker. It's Lou Pugliese, um, who uh, joins us from America today. He's Executive Vice President at University of Maryland Global Campus, <coughs> and he has more than 20 years of experience in e-learning innovation. For example, as Senior Innovation Fellow and Managing Director of the U Arizona State University Action Lab at PLUS. Uh, or the founding CEO of Blackboard. Uh, some of you might know this system. So, Lou, the stage is yours. Uh, thanks very much. I uh, really appreciate uh, being here and you inviting us uh, to speak about these important topics. Um, I, just, just to start, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, where we are as an industry, uh, shift in critical programs that we need to do universally, and how that impacts, you know, how we need to operate in changing our, our business from uh, where we are today to new modalities of digital teaching and learning and uh, the learning science research, frankly, that's needed around it. And, and so we tend to look at this and as I'm exiting UMGC, we, we're looking specifically at um, how uh, our education infrastructure in the, in the United States um, is in this post-pandemic world and the institutional pivots that need to take place. Um, you know, in America, we view this, you know, among all institutions, you know, as a reckoning. And I think that reckoning is global and uh, there are really no geographic boundaries here. Uh, we all are suffering from the same kinds of challenges. And among those challenges are uh, recalibrating uh, our institutional delivery and the effectiveness of, of our mainstream programs, undergraduate and graduate degrees. Uh, and, and I think we look back and we say, there's a collective statement uh, across America that our students and parents uh, are saying, you know, Zoom class after Zoom class, is, is this all there is? And so uh, we have to understand how we're going to reconstruct and reinvent um, our institutional systems to make global impact. Um, so we really need to think differently about the core of our institutions to rapidly uh, set this change in motion and, and, and really ask our question, you know, about how our institutions are changing, what we need to be doing uh, differently, specifically with a business model. Um, if you look at healthcare as an infrastructure or manufacturing as an infrastructure, how are these changing? And how do we need to change along with our own infrastructure? Um, I think it's true that private sector companies globally that will survive are those that have very strong uh, cash positions on their balance sheet. And this is not the way we think about things in higher education. We, we, it's not true for you know, how we're going to survive based on just how our cash balance is looking. And so uh, when we look at what the future holds, we know that you know, over 30%, at least in, in our country of students may not be showing up this fall. And so how do we have to make the economic shift and the business model shift that allows us to avoid some of the challenges that we're seeing, for instance, in the retail section where there's a death march. And so we, we really need to look at this quite differently. And one of the biggest challenges I think that we had you know, entering this environment is we looked at digital teaching and learning 
and a whole education infrastructure as a retreat, as we're retreating to an online environment, um, using it more uh, of a crutch. And we have to realize that our first cohort of learners are those learners that are being educated through advanced technologies that better prepare students for the future. And I think that's a better way that uh, in any future pandemic, we need to enter the environment where um, this is a method that students are going to advance their lives in terms of their interaction with technology. So we need to, to reinvent the business model. And, and, you know, in the past, we looked at this as you don't knock down a wall just because there's a crack. Well, guess what? We, we need to be, to be knocking down walls. And we need to do that with new learning infrastructure. Um, we need to look deeply at our, at our cost structure and financial stability. We need to engage in deep research um, and use this as an opportunity for uh, research and development and a great deal of experimentation with new learning modalities. And we need to shift our institutions so that we can look at education as an engine for economic development. And we've said that implicitly in the past. Well, now it's time to be very explicit and very deliberate about how we look specifically for uh, our, our institutions as being an agent for change for economic development. And there are lots of ways we need to do that. One way we need to start is a new design imperative for new methods of, of teaching and learning. New synchronous learning uh, opportunities and technologies that will support this. Uh, faculty and students looking at new ways to engage in, in their studies, look at research and the science behind what we are doing, how students learn in this environment, um, new instructional design parameters. If you neuroimage to every student's brain, we know that they learn differently. We know that there are gender and social biases in social emotional development. We need to involve uh, deeply our data architecture and look at the behavioral and social sciences of how we engage with our learners in the future. And we need to look at methods for, for better student success and engagement through new technologies, new competency frameworks, new micro-credentialing environments. And so, so we cannot look at this as a retreat any longer and we have to look at how we, we structure our institutions economically and how we look at new design imperatives for how we're going to re-engage in this post-pandemic world. Um, so that's my, uh, my opening remarks. Thank you, Lou. Um, so you talked a lot about also changing business models or developing new business models. Which role will micro-credentials or micro-certificates, we talked about them in the sessions before, uh, which role will they play for universities in future? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, you know, we, many of us are in an environment where our core business model has been under the focus on undergraduate and graduate degrees and doing the best we can and, and really reconstructing our, our environment. Now it's time to really recalibrate um, to restructure around this new inst institutional mission that's driving economic development. So we have a, a new 60 year degree imperative that we have to change our institutional mission around. And that's very, very difficult. And what we do as institutions is we typically try to retrofit these new, um, new institutional missions to an existing infrastructure that we have. And so I would encourage us uh, all to look at ways that we need how we change and reconstruct critical areas of our education delivery machine in academic affairs, in student engagement and recruiting, in technology in particular, and how do we reorganize our own internal infrastructure and not just retrofit to a new challenge in the marketplace. We need to look at re-examining programs across the board to recalibrate the design of major areas of studies focusing specifically on growth industries and, and growth skills and reinvent curricula around, you know, those economic development mandates that we have in our regions. Tamara uh, lost connection. I might hop in and um, invite Hannes Schwaderer to continue with his statement. 
Welcome. All right. Thanks. Uh, Tamara looks frozen, so I hope she will uh, warm up quickly. So um, thanks for the introduction. I'd uh, like to take a look from the perspective of a global company. So not in education, I'm a recipient of education uh, quite a bit. And it's, that's in the high tech industry. I'm working for Intel. Um, and we are this little chip company that you may know. So on the sign of uh, where is the things, where are things going? I would like to start with the observation. And one of the ob observations over the past months has been that our business, the digitalization of everything has dramatically accelerated. And that is going through all industries, including education, as you have uh, already mentioned in several aspects. Um, it has also become apparent where we were falling short. Uh, for example, now all over Sutton, we do need talent in that global digitalization trend that we don't have. Not at the quality we needed, not at the quantity we needed, so we were badly prepared. But equally, education wasn't greatly prepared for that COVID-19 situation. So homeschooling, hybrid learning, uh, wasn't really prepared. We didn't have the media in any cases. We didn't have the infrastructure. And a PDF is not digital learning, right? So uh, again, that has accelerated also the development in teaching in, in all different aspects. Now that has also impacted not just us, it has mostly impacted our customers. And many of our customers are small and medium businesses. They have been impacted by that crisis more because they don't have the capital so they've been more careful in, with investments. They don't have access to the same talent that we have as a major company. And they don't have the expertise in digitalization that we might have in many of the big companies. So that has dramatic consequences for our economies, but also our society. Remember that most of the employment in Europe is offered by small and medium companies. So it has a massive impact to our society when these players cannot compete in the times of crisis. And it's mainly driven also to a lack of digitalization. So we as a global company, Intel, we work wherever it's feasible. We do R&D wherever it's feasible. It means we can attract the talent from around the world to any place in the world. Or we just go to places where we find the talent. And uh, as you are probably aware, country by country, even within a country in different cities, we find specific talent, specific know-how driven by the specific teaching in the universities. And that for us as a global com company is not an issue, right? We, we know where to find the talent or we even place our offices next to that talent, next to that university, where we believe we get the talent we get. That's different for small and medium companies. They cannot attract talent from around the world and they cannot attract the tops of the top of the students for high tech development, for example, that we can attract. So um, this is becoming not so much a problem, hasn't become a, such, such a big problem over past years. We also see that specific industries grow specific know-how in the nearby universities because they educate for the industries that are near, which is great. Also, the governments uh, actually support this type of development. They do support industry uh, education that then supports the local industry. So that's fine as long as it doesn't change as much as it did and new skills and knowledge is being required. That's no longer available locally. And that's why, again, our small and medium enterprises need to reach out and have a harder time to get the talent. And that is, I think, a, a major issue looking at the future EU competitiveness. As long as we stay within our small circles and don't look abroad, our competitiveness is uh, at risk. Now, the thesis coming from uh, what I just uh, shared as, a, as observations is digitalization will continue to accelerate. And just like artificial intelligence, digital, uh, anything digital will become part of our daily life in all aspects, professional and private. So for higher education, that means that I think digital competencies, not necessarily deep knowledge or engineering knowledge, but competencies about digital need to become part of every single uh, curriculum. 
um, at least to the level that you have an understanding of the mechanisms and the business models behind digital business. Models. I believe that the market driven specializations we have take in Germany, machinery, automotive is no longer enough. They need to be enriched with digital competencies. I believe that the offerings of higher education institutions need to be better sized to fit the needs of different sizes of companies. A small company, a medium company, and a large company have different needs of offerings, like full-time, part-time, um, or for example, for extra uh, educational services and offerings. Um, so that needs to be adapted to the local and the specific needs of companies. And then I believe higher education needs to become more collaborative across the faculties or interdisciplinary. One example I love is, I think we should not teach artificial intelligence without teaching ethics. So it becomes more complex. And sorry, uh, dear teachers and professors, I believe that the technical development is faster than you will ever be able to rewrite a curriculum. Therefore, knowledge is continues to be important for us. We want your education. We want your academic education for the people we want to hire. But on top of that, we need skills, or they were called in an er earlier uh, call, they were called competencies. And we call them the four C's. It's critical thinking, it's creativity, it's about communication and collaboration skills. Thank you. And nice to be back with you. <laughs> Thank you to tethering. <laughs> um, so you talked about how universities uh, can or should support the demand of uh, companies. Mm -hmm. What can universities do, especially to support um, the topic of further training of employees? Yeah, I think, uh, as I said earlier, um, you were thinking about new business models. Lou was thinking about new business models. And what we do today is, yes, we tap into offerings also from companies. I mean, as a as a chip company, obviously, we are very much interested in the development of cloud, as an example. So, yes, we encourage our people to do cloud uh, courses that are offered by the cloud service providers, the big guys. And that gives them even a little certificate that helps them. Now, why don't you offer that as a service? Why do we as IT companies, high tech companies need to develop the curriculum for ourselves? to also teach our own people. I think these micro curricula or micro certificates as a service, uh, if they, as long as they are uh, custom made for specific industries, is a good business model. And I think that is something we would definitely take as an offer. Uh, so yeah, I think that's one thing that universities or higher education institutions can do. The other thing is, an example where I had the pleasure to contribute a little bit, at least the idea, is again back to small and medium businesses here in the Alps region, so Switzerland, Austria, Germany, which is dominated by small and medium companies, and they are lacking digital knowledge. So we work with a number of universities across these countries to develop curricula that can be, that are affordable for small and medium uh, companies, so say the 10K dollars, 10K euro range for a full master program. We call it digital master agent. And what's nice about it is that people do that next to their full-time jobs because usually small and medium companies cannot afford to send people away for two years uh, to do their master. Uh, the second part is a recognized master. So it's a certificate you really get. And the third one is probably most important that it's a modular program. So if you have more of a commercial need to understand digitalization, you can put more of the weight in your studies on that part. If it's more of a technical need, you can put more weight on that part. So it's, it's, you can more or less custom, customize uh, your master studies. And I think it's one of the offering that's more flexible. It's shared between different universities. It's affordable and it's custom made for a specific audience. 
Thank you. So I would say we changed the question session for everybody. I would maybe start with one question like uh, Costas talked about uh, co cooperation between universities to design curricula. Um, Hannes, you also mentioned that in one example. Um, can this be the way um, we can create something more flexible for the future <coughs> to have um, mixed curricula between different universities. Lou, how was your view on that? Yeah, I believe so. I think that <clears throat> the challenge that we have, uh, as Hannes indicated, is that um, we're structured in many cases um, to be a supply-oriented organization as a learning institution that serves a particular profile of a learner. And we're designed and built that way to do that, right? And so um, unbundling what we do and restructuring what we do towards restructuring for a 60-year degree where we don't need an entire degree, but we need rapid upskilling for certain types of industries and taking what we have today and reconstituting that in a competency environment is a very, very difficult thing to do. So it's going to require... Um, you know, inter-institutional relationships globally in order to do that, um, to be able to leverage the rapid change that are necessary to be able to compensate for what business and industry needs. And so when it comes to sort of reconstituting uh, our faculty, um, the center of knowledge around certain industries and what we teach and what we learn and redesigning that, we have to take into consideration the balance between the, the challenge of education up, how do we need to restructure towards a 60 year degree, and then corporation down, meaning how do corporations reinvent their learning infrastructure? That can't be done to a one-to-one -one relationship. That's gonna have to be done with a lot of interrelationships, interinstitutional, intercorporate relationships, uh, to get that right. And, and we're going to have to do that. It's the only way that we're going to be able to do that in uh, the rapid environment that we need to change. Okay, thank you. Kostas, do you yeah. want to add something to this topic? Yeah, further uh, to Lou's uh, um, comment or so, uh, I consider universities as uh, central actors of the knowledge square which includes education, research, innovation, and service to community and business. Uh, universities uh, must play and should play a key role in driving even uh, the uh, circumstances that uh, came as products of the COVID-19 or so. Uh, to a great, to, to a great uh, extent, you know, the challenge of university education systems is not merely or only to meet demand with an expansion of campuses or places or so, but also to adapt programs and teaching and learning to match a more diverse set of student needs. And learning, I would like to repeat it, to match a more diverse uh, uh, set of student needs while also meeting the needs of economy and uh, business and society. To help shape an appropriate response to wider participation in uh, universities, policymakers need to address the many new interests and needs of, uh, of larger student bodies that exist not just in Europe but everywhere that is more, this body is more varied than previously uh, in age, social background and prior educational experience. However, international indicators that can reflect this diversity do not yet exist. This is a major problem. The principle of weakness is the lack of comparative information on individual characteristics and choices. Most of the available indicators uh, derived from programs or institutions reported data from your institution, my institution anyway, 
but uh, from institutional reported data and so fail to provide the kind of information needed to understand better deliberate choices such as uh, program changes or joint programs, drop out, stop out and combinations of different types of university uh, studies. Uh, to me, this is fundamental. And also I like to add to our conversation another factor that I'm very pleased as an academician uh, because it came from uh, the Bonn Declaration on Freedom of Scientific Research, draft under the German uh, presidency of the European Union Council last uh, October, particularly in, on 20th of October. The text notes the importance of deploying more effective instruments to ensure scientific freedom to allow me to read quote unquote, closely follow the establishment of a monitoring system on academic freedom in the European higher education area. Uh, I would like to say that European University Association and uh, it's a national university association, I would say, but I like to concentrate uh, on European University Association has been directly involved in this ongoing initiative of the Bologna follow-up group through its participation with relevant working groups. Just to finalize, you know that uh, the education system, particularly in tertiary education, is changing rapidly. And the competitiveness is very, very high in all regions, not just within Europe, I would say. So all these type of things that uh, I discussed previously about national, uh, knowledge square and uh, lack of international indicators, plus, you know, the recommendation of uh, the Bonn Declaration makes sense, you know, to what we have to do today, you know, uh, uh, universities and policy makers in its uh, uh, EU uh, country. Thank you, Costas. Maybe Tamara, I jump in. Um, yeah, here there were two comments about the role of governments in this uh, process. And there was one remark from Claudine she wrote, don't you think that the COVID has accelerated the, cha uh, the change more than national government policies in the EU? And um, with that goes Thomas Santoro. He is asking, to what extent do you think the government should have an active role? And he uh, refers to changing the um, infrastructure environment, the digital infrastructure that um, governments provide. Now, maybe Hannes Schwaderer, uh, you could um, reply to that. Yeah, I think um the government has, of course, a role in that, uh, but it's not limited to helping education or research uh, or higher education. Infrastructure is a role they have to play for everyone. It's for the businesses, but it's also for education. So that certainly is something where we look at governments to make these decisions. Some look at uh, funding it themselves. Some look at uh, industry to support it because there must be a business model behind it. Otherwise, you shouldn't do it infrastructure in particular digital infrastructure is different because we couldn't find a one business model that really works for everyone and that's why governments take care of infrastructure um, similarly uh, governments especially here in europe many schools are government owned and the equipment has to come through government funding uh, you saw programs here in germany with a 5.5 billion investment into the digital pact that uh, supports infrastructure in schools to an extent in universities. Um, so yeah, there is a role of government, but it's an enabling role and it's not a determining role. And that's, that's where I think uh, comes back to what Costa said. We want governments to support free science, research, free universities, uh, and not determine particularly what they should go for in terms of content, research and subjects right but we want them of course to provide the capabilities the basic capabilities uh, for teaching and i think that that is kind of where we should differentiate 
the roads of government. Inga, you want to add another question from the audience? Um, I think there was a very interesting remark by Beate Baltes. The pandemic showed that many figured out home office and online work as well as online learning. Many did not and still struggle. Nine months later, what separates these two groups? Um, maybe there would be a question to, to Lou, probably. Well, yeah, I mean, I look, I think this is a question of design. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to really um, look very closely and develop a research agenda that focuses on um, how students succeed and don't exceed from the student experience. Um, we don't necessarily have good science behind this. We, we studied it at ASU. We drew some very significant conclusions that informs the instructional design and the presentation. But, <clears throat> you know, this is the first time that faculty and students who have had no experience whatsoever are engaging in the world of, of their studies. And, you know, we, we all know that they're entering their classroom for the first times and they're living where in rooms anywhere in the world which drives an, a, a new design imperative. And so um, we really un need to understand, um, you know, what is this personal engagement experience? It's the first time that we don't have a one-to-one -one or a classroom experience. So what's unique about what we're dealing with today that allows us to design new instructional design parameters? Um, you know, what are the influences that drive uh, learning? And I think that, what's very, very important that people haven't really embraced yet is for the first time, we have the data architecture. We have the ability to collect strategic information about you know, how these learning systems and learner analytics um, work in, you know, for, for students for the first time. This is very strong behavioral and social science that we need to engage in to understand the triggers that uh, student behaviors, what triggers student behaviors for exceptional experience, and, and what is it that we know that works in, in conventional methods like social media. You know, all students have almost an immediate expectation because of their, their consumer social media world experience and what translates. Um, so we really need to understand, uh, you know, some research and development and understand um, how we engage in large-scale experimentation to know what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Thank you. I think there's another interesting remark by Beate. Um, she writes, if as just presented, higher ed can't keep up with technological innovations, then maybe it makes no sense at all to teach technology, but instead teach the skills to learn by doing, critical thinking, grit to figure it out, self-motivation to learn something on your own, etc. Hannes, what do you think? Should we still teach technology, although we're not as fast as technology is? Oh, yes, absolutely. So I think we need both. Uh, we need very deep knowledge, in particular with our engineers. Right? They are designing the most complicated products on Earth, and you cannot do that without an academic uh, education. But on top of that, we need the skills to stay flexible, to stay innovative, to stay, uh, stay curious uh, and you know, as we heard in the last session, there is so many things we cannot predict, but we still need to prepare for them. And these are the skills we need on top of very rock solid know-how, scientific know-how. Mm -hmm. It's not black and white, it's not either or, it's, we need both of it. Thank you. Okay. Is there another question, Inga, or did we cover all questions? Uh, may, may, may I interrupt you? Uh, yes, sure. For, or to add something to what uh, Hannes already said about technology, which is quite interesting. I like to add, uh, to complement on this, uh, the factor of social innovation. Sometimes we, we think about innovation, and what we have in our minds is only technology. It's not just technology. It's easy, you know, to adapt, uh, let's say, to a technological mechanism or so, but it's very hard uh, to adapt, you know, the uh, 
the social type of innovation, because this requires more in the interdisciplinary uh, connectedness. Uh, I would like to say, taking into consideration technology, that uh, we have to uh, be more inclusive, more uh, innovative, more interconnected, and uh, of course uh, resilient, more resilient, uh, in order to uh, uh, tackle uh, a crisis like uh, the crisis in 2007 or the pandemic crisis that uh, we experience uh, today. Particularly within the university ecosystem, we need, we need these uh, mechanisms uh, in order to uh, face uh, the post-pandemic period in a positive, I would say, manner, if it's possible, or so to speak. Thanks. Thank you all for your very interesting input. Um, I would say we now have the five minutes break because we go into the last session talking about connecting all the levels we talked about today and also the follow up activities we plan. So join us in the next session, clicking on the left side on sessions. Thanks a lot to everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank Auf Wiedersehen. You. Have a good evening. Auf Wiedersehen, Kostas. Auf Wiedersehen.